Well, you're listening to Quad Dot Rocks, God of the World and Other Things. I'm Kenny Price, your host. Our mission, you got it, advancing equilibrium in the midst of an agitated world. Hey, this is still season 18. We have a few more episodes in season 18. This is episode 389, title 3 a.m., The Witching Hour. Subtitle, Thoughts on Consistent Sleep Interruptions. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night, rolled over, looked at the clock, and it's 3 a.m.? It's not 2.59, and it's not 3.01. It's 3 o'clock on the dot. And it hasn't happened to you once, but many times throughout your life. Hey, what's going on here? The exactness of the moment speaks to your soul that something is going on. You just don't know what. There are all sorts of explanations on the web that try to explain what is going on. Some call 3 a.m. the witching hour, a term that has been used to refer to a specific time often associated with increased supernatural or paranormal activities when supernatural forces, spirits, or otherworldly entities are more active. The speculation says, since Jesus died at 3 p.m., those who worship Satan gather for worship at the opposite of that time, 3 a.m., making it a time when the veil between the physical and spiritual realms is believed to be thin. The history of the concept appears to date back to at least the 1700s, some say the 1500s, but I think the talk measured against history is just lore. Others say the sleep disturbance is caused by the circadian rhythm and the rise of cortisol. Technically, it's always 3 o'clock somewhere on the planet. It might not be exactly 3 a.m. since there are minutes involved. The range could be between the hours of 3 and 4 a.m. The concept that all those who worship Satan are convening the moment you wake up at 3 a.m., provoking the sleep disruption, is not happening. For these types of questions, we must appeal to the authority of the Bible for clarity and truth. There is no passage in the Bible that speaks specifically about the witching hour or devil hour. Since the term's origination is vague, I think the phrase is more of an observation of how the world seems to work and how evil works. We have no indicator that demons require sleep. They are active 24-7, 365, carrying out the devil's work. Job 1.6 says, One day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord asked Satan, Where have you come from? From roaming through the earth, Satan answered him, and walking around on it. The Apostle Peter gives us understanding on what Satan is doing as he is walking on the earth. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. So the accuser, the slanderer, is perpetually roaming around seeking whom he can drink down. That's what the scripture literally means, to drink down, to totally consume. The reason for this discussion is not to glorify the devil or his work on the planet, but something is going on that wakes us up at 3 a.m. on the dot. The fact that there are so many people who experience sleep disruption like this says that it is real. My friend, here is what it is. I think it has to do with the perpetual works of Satan on the earth and the results of living in a fallen, diseased world. The Bible talks about the connection between the works of evil and night and darkness. On the night Judas betrayed Jesus, Christ was in deep anguish in prayer. His prayers of anguish must have been loud. Three of the four Gospels record his words. Jesus Christ was arrested by the temple guards and illegally put on trial through the night until dawn. Looking back in history, the Nuremberg rallies, a propaganda tool of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party, were massive and intimidating nighttime rallies held each September at specially designed assembly grounds which spanned 11 square kilometers. The rallies occurred from 1933 at the beginning of the Nazi regime until 1938. The 1939 rally planned to be called, now get this, the Rally of Peace, was canceled at the last minute as Germany invaded Poland and sparked World War II. The gathering of hundreds of thousands of party loyalists were illuminated by thousands of torchlight-carrying participants against a backdrop of a massive array of 152 anti-aircraft searchlights placed at 12-meter intervals and pointed skyward. The Cathedral of Light, as it was called, was designed by architect Albert Speer. The result was a gleaming wall of light encircling the rally and making it visible for miles around. The rallies, which were documented in Lenny Riefenstahl's propaganda films, including Triumph of the Will, were meant as displays of unity, strength, and German commitment to the Nazi cause. The darkness, the torches, the precision movement, the nighttime hours— an alignment of the massive number of people, 
like a midnight mass led by the high priest of evil, Adolf Hitler, was an externally overt, in-your-face manifestation of the evil that roams perpetually across the earth with an insatiable appetite to drink down all that can be subdued. So we know that evil is always among us, and it only makes sense that it is freer with its actions in the cloak of darkness. But whether the clock says it's 3 a.m. or 3 p.m., we know that if we know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, that evil forces have no hold on us. We have the same access to God in the middle of the night as we do in the daytime. Psalm 139 verse 12 is a good prayer for those who wake up afraid. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. My intention of this podcast episode is for us to see the opportunity we have to acutely focus our attention on God and what He wants to say to us when we wake up at 3 a.m. I think the credit for the nighttime awakening should be attributed to God, our Heavenly Father, and not to the forces of evil. When God wakes us up in the middle of the night, our conscious minds have been at rest. Competing stimulation from the world is paused in those nighttime moments, and in the silence of our bedrooms, God wants to speak. As we watch absurd governmental and human action taken to the most outlandish, evil, and truly insane level, we must be watchful both day and night, staying constantly in communication with our Lord God Almighty. Friend, I'm here to testify that prayer works, and it can move God to move mountains and do miracles on our behalf and for His glory alone. I really have a question in my mind about the amount of required sleep a human really needs. I know what our modern science says of eight hours sleep a night and all the bad side effects that accompany sleep deprivation, yet I look in the Bible and see the activities that occurred in the night, the disruptions in the night, the visitation by holy angels in the night, Jesus himself praying in the middle of the night, and it just makes me wonder. The Psalms clearly speak about a person who is vigilant before God in the watches of the night. The concept of the watches of the night is mentioned in Psalm 63, verse 6 specifically, But I want to read the psalm for context to the situation that provoked this psalm. The psalmist reflects on his longing for God and expresses devotion even during the night. Psalm 63, a psalm of David, when he was in the desert of Judah. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. The night watches refer to three divisions of the night, each corresponding to a time period. The first watch or evening watch typically began at sunset and lasted until around 10 p.m. The second watch or midnight watch was from 10 p.m. until 2 a.m. The third watch or early morning watch extended from around 2 a.m. until sunrise. It covered the early morning hours before dawn. The watches of the night had military, religious, and personal meaning in ancient Israel. From a military standpoint, guards were assigned to watch over cities and encampments throughout the night. These watches lasted around three hours each, ensuring vigilant protection. Certain religious activities were performed at specific times during the night, requiring individuals to stay awake during their assigned watch. The nighttime quietude provided an opportunity for personal reflection, introspection, and prayer, as we see in various psalms where the psalmist speaks of staying awake through the watches. Psalm 63 verse 6 says, When I remember you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. Psalm 119 verses 147 and 148 reads, My eyes anticipate the watches of the night that I may meditate on your word. I am awake through each watch of the night to meditate on your promises. Psalm 134, 1 says, Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. There is no place or time to go where God is not present. God is omnipresent. The next time you and I are waked up in the nighttime hours, we need to see it as a time to reflect on God and as a time for vigilant prayer, a time to contemplate, reflect, and remember God, an uninterrupted time of spiritual devotion and prayer. So, my friend, the next time you wake up 3 a.m., first say, yes, Lord, I'm listening. 
and listen to what God has to say, then pray. Remember, the sun is always shining somewhere. So my friend, may you go in peace now to love and serve the Lord.